As a teenager, I became intrigued by the pervasive focus on individual differences and the power they held in my life and many aspects of society. It created a humble curiosity to understand the influences of human behavior. I consistently observed a common phenomenon that underpins many of our experiences as humans that I've since come to understand as othering. I realized that othering is one of the many things all humans have in common. Having this perspective at an early age provided a unique lens through which I viewed the world. Like generations of my ancestors and many of yours, I've spent my entire life navigating the intersectionality of multiple ascribed identities meant to define me as the other. I eventually realized that despite all of my efforts to belong, whether through contributing to my community or my professional and educational achievements, I would always be the other to some. We are what we think, not what we think we are. Hi. Hi. I'm Sonia Pemberton and I'm doing a TED Talk. Okay. And I was wondering if I could ask you a question. Sure. What does othering mean to you? Oh, um, to me, othering means the ways that we sort of don't identify ourselves with others. So you know, it could be race, it could be gender, it could be age. So yeah, just sort of those things. Hey, hey. oh, this is my Hi. friend Emma. Hi, Emma. Hello. I wondered if you'd do me a favor. Sure. I'm doing a TED Talk, and I wanted to ask you a question, the same one I asked your friend. Okay. What does othering mean to you? When I hear the word othering, I think the first thing that comes into my mind is the word judgment. Mm. Judging others, judging ourselves, and, and it prevents us from making meaningful connections with other people. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> othering is a conscious or unconscious choice to focus on a broad range of human differences perpetuating exclusionary practices and behaviors. Many of us other ourselves, whether consciously or unconsciously. The impact depends on the inner voice that compares us to another person. You know, those subtle or not so subtle thoughts about whether I'm good enough, smart enough, or perhaps attractive enough. The perception of ourselves relative to another individual or group of individuals drives our behaviors and can have consequences for us and the perceived other. When we can't appreciate our uniqueness as an individual without being less than or better than another, we have a propensity to other someone else. Many times, these thoughts lie beneath our conscious awareness. These assumptions and beliefs become issues when they influence our behavior in our daily lives specifically how we interact with the perceived other, even when the other is you. These perceptions and comparisons include various classifications and stigmas, like physical ability, religious affiliation, professional roles, age, marital status, gender identification, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, parenting status, ethnicity, mental health status, and many other characterizations. Perhaps you or someone you know or care about can be identified as the other by one or more of these classifications. Othering occurs when we perceive anything that could be a threat, whether it is a person, a conversation, or an environment. Our natural inclination to other is an ever-present reality that touches many spheres of life and has consequences for each of us as it affects many of the systems designed for our livelihood and protection. We have seen the effects in education, healthcare, banking, real estate, policing, the courts, even the right to vote, and unfortunately, the list goes on. When our conscious or unconscious assumptions influence how we make decisions at work, at home, or in our society, coupled with the influence or power we may have over the livelihood or protection of the perceived other, it can have devastating ramifications. What's really fascinating is that the brain doesn't differentiate social threats from physical threats. Whether it perceives an insult, 
or a grizzly bear headed our way, a threat response is triggered, prompting us to be defensive to avoid or deflect the threat. Social scientists suggest that in as little as 10 seconds, we begin to make judgments about someone we see or meet for the first time. We begin to create narratives about who we perceive them to be based on our beliefs about the other. Using Sigmund Freud's iceberg theory, if those initial impressions were accurate, they would only be the tip of the iceberg. Hidden beneath the surface lies the complexities of an individual's life journey. It is within those complexities that we can discover the shared lived experiences of humankind. Neuroscience research suggests we have a natural inclination to other. It is our brain's fail-safe mechanism. Our brain is responsible for our survival, and its main job is to keep us safe. To do so, it is wired to notice differences. We know from the developmental theories of understanding how people think or interpret events and how they are likely to act in many situations. As human beings, we operate in three dimensions, the cognitive, what we think, the affective, how we feel, and the behavioral, how we act. Interestingly, we are not aware of many drivers that influence our behavior. Neuroscience research also suggests that our unconscious mind controls 95% of our actions. Imagine your unconscious mind as a vast database that's been collecting and storing data all your life, much of it without your awareness. It's constantly scanning the environment, taking note of everything you see, are told, and experience. I should also mention that the brain is lazy. It doesn't want to expend too much energy. So whenever you're faced with a situation, it will scan the stored old data from previous observations and experiences to address the current situation and determine how you should respond or react. Take a moment and think about this. We are using our conscious mind only 5% of the time. 95% of our decisions and our actions are unconscious, making it even more important to be aware of our thoughts and beliefs because they trigger our feelings and influence our behavior. To mitigate othering, we must become aware of our thoughts because we are what we think, not what we think we are. Given the numerous inequities and insidious discord we've all witnessed both domestically and globally, I believe the timing is right for a new approach to many humanitarian issues that have plagued societies across the globe for centuries. In the last 50 plus years, we've attempted to address the brain's focus on differences with an intellectual methodology in an effort to change our thinking. And it's not working. By understanding all humans are wired to see differences, and by default, we are all the other. We embark on an introspective transformational journey to gain the tools to disrupt the unconscious database that dictates our thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors. We can take personal social responsibility to dispel the myth of the other in our interactions with ourselves, our family members, social groups, and within our communities and organizations, and embrace a new integrative and transformational approach. A quote from Emily Dickinson is a reminder of the influence and impact we each have on any situation at any moment. Forever is composed of nows. The question we should continually ask ourselves is, what does this moment need from me? We are each a droplet in the sea of humanity. When we commit to integrative transformational work and become aware of our thoughts, we can change our behavior and create a ripple effect for societal transformation across the world. By collectively choosing to take personal social responsibility to dispel the myth of the other by opening our minds, our hearts, with humble curiosity, we can empower a global movement committed to an inclusive new era for humanity.